Hi, I'm Marty Joel from the Boston Fact Pressure Private Limited. In this video, we're going to cover specific details on FSCR. This is a new standardized approach for computing the exposure amount for the derivative contract. I would like to further elaborate on this issue, so let us start by understanding what is SSCR. So, SSCR is a new methodology to compute the exposure amount of derivative contract. The BCBS 239 published it in March of 2014, whereas the US Fed published the proposal in December of 2018. It is mainly used because CEM, SM, and IMM have some drawbacks. CEM are not risk sensitive, SM is not much in use, and IMM is applicable only for advanced approach banks. It's also very complex and has some stringent approval requirements. Talking about the key issues of CEM, firstly, there's no differentiation of margin and unmargin transactions. So what is a margin transaction and variation margin? Well, a transaction where variable margin is exchanged is called as a margin transaction. When there is no variation margin exchanged, then it is termed as unmargin transaction. Let us understand the distinction between an initial margin and a variation margin. Coming to variation margins, when parties exchange variation margin on a periodic basis during the term of a derivative contract, as typically specified in a variation margin agreement, variation margin offsets changes in the market value of a derivative contract and thereby covers the potential loss arising from default of a counterparty. Coming to initial margin, it is also known as independent collateral. Variation margin may not always be sufficient to cover a party's positive exposure, example due to delays in receiving collateral, and thus parties may exchange initial margin. Parties typically exchange initial margin at the outset of the derivative contract. Parties typically post initial margin in amounts that would reduce the likelihood of a positive exposure amount for the derivative contract in the event of the counterparty's default, resulting in over collateralization. Effectively, the margin transactions will result in lesser exposure amount under SACCR when compared with CEM methodology. The add on factors used in potential future exposure are defined prior to global financial crisis. These are not reflecting the actual volatility, so need to be calibrated and used in PFE computation. Lastly, the netting benefits are defined too simplistically in computing the PFE under CEM methodology by using the NGR net to gross ratio, whereas the revised methodology has proposed the offsetting based on sound economic relationships. For example, in case of interest rate derivatives, the full offsetting is permitted within the maturity bucket, only partial offsetting is permitted across the time buckets within the same currency. I can show this while discussing on the PFE. Let us now look at the applicability of SSCR in two dimensions. Firstly, we'll look into the category of bank and its approach, and secondly, the derivative product type. If you look at the last column, for all the fund contribution, it is SSCR irrespective of the bank. Now, if you look at the middle row, advanced banks and STD approaches, it is again SSCR approach irrespective of the derivative product. Now, if you look at the top row for advanced banks and for their advanced approaches, banks have the option to use either SSCR or IMM approach for cleared and non-cleared derivatives. Similarly, for non-advanced banks, banks have the option to use either CEM or SSCR for cleared and non-cleared derivatives. So how do we compute the exposure amount as per the SSCR guidelines? Well, it is basically the alpha factor multiplied by RC plus BFE, where alpha stands for the alpha factor set at 1.4, RC is the replacement cost, and BFE is the potential future exposures. So what is an alpha factor? As we already know, the alpha factor is set at 1.4. Effectively, it will increase the RC plus BFE by 40%. The value of 1.4 has carried over from the alpha factor set by Basel Committee for the internal model method and as well as the beta parameter within the ESM. In this slide, let us understand the replacement cost computation in detail. Let us start with the derivative contract. The first step is to check whether it is subjected to netting or not. If there is a master netting agreement in place, those contracts are referred to as netable contracts and otherwise non-netable contracts. If it is not netable, a simple RC formula is used which is as under. I shall explain these acronyms a bit later. If it is netable, however, then we need to check whether there is any margin agreement in existence or not. In the previous slide, I have explained what a margin agreement is, which is nothing but an agreement to exchange variable margins. If non-existing, then it is treated as unmargined contracts and treated at par with non-netable agreement for computing the replacement cost. Now let's see the next steps. If margin agreement exists, then we need to check whether there is one MA 
or more per netting agreement. If yes, one netting agreement has more than one MA, then we need to create a subnetting set and apply a bit more complex formula to compute the replacement cost. Now let's see another scenario, whether one MA is mapped to more than one netting agreement. If the answer is no, then the computation happens at the netting agreement level. In another scenario, if one MA is mapped to more than one netting agreement, then we need to create a super netting agreement and apply the most complex formula for the replacement cost, which is as under. The formula appears to be complex, but if we understand the acronyms of the variables, it is quite simple. Let us see it one by one. CMV stands for current market value. NICA stands for net independent collateral amount. This is nothing but the net of initial margins exchanged between the parties. VM stands for variation margin. This we have discussed in the previous slide. And TH stands for variation margin threshold and MTA for minimum transferable account. Let me explain a bit more on threshold and MTA. Margin agreements typically provide for a threshold amount and minimum transfer amount. The threshold amount is acceptable level of under collateralization. So the exchange of variation margin happens only when the derivative contract values move above the threshold. MTA is the smallest amount of collateral amount that a part must transfer when it is required to exchange. Now, if you look at these formulas, they look quite simple, don't they? Before we move on to the PFE computation, let us understand the granularity of computation. Effectively, the computation happens at the margin agreement level. If the relation between margin agreement and master netting agreement is one to one, then the computation is at netting agreement level. Suppose that the relation of MA and MNA is one to many. Then the computation is referred to as super netting level. And lastly, if the relation between MA and MNA is many to one, then the computation is referred to as subnetting level. Effectively, the computation of RC and PFE is expected at margin agreement granularity. In SSS here, the BFT computation happens in a phased manner. It starts at the lowest granularity, meaning derivative contract level, and then rolled up to hedging sets, then onto asset class, and finally up to netting set level. As I explained in the previous slides, it can be at netting set level, subnetting set level, or at super netting set level. The regulator has defined five asset classes for PFE computation. And they are interest rate, equity, forex, commodity, and credit derivatives. These are also generally in sync with earlier CEM methodology. Within each asset class, hedging sets have been defined. So what is a hedging set? We all know that hedging is nothing but mitigation. But in the derivative world, hedging is generally achieved by entering into opposite transactions. And regulator has allowed to create hedging sets to avail the benefit of mitigation while computing the PFE. So how do we create a hedging set? Well, we can do so by just grouping the derivative contracts with similar risk factors. Let us look at regulator defined hedging sets. Maturity bucket per currency, reference entity, currency pair, commodity categories, and reference entity. Let me better explain the entire PFE computation with an illustration. Let us consider netting set level which has nine different derivative contracts. Five of these contracts belong to the interest rate asset class and the remaining four belong to other asset classes like equity, forex, commodity, and credit derivatives. In the case of interest rate asset class, I've created the complexity of hedging sets to demonstrate the roll-up calculations. Out of the five interest rate contracts, three belong to the USD, while the other two belong to INR. So effectively, the first three belong to one hedging set and the last two belong to another hedging set. For interest rate within the hedging set, computations need to happen at the maturity bucket level. To demonstrate this, I've shown variance in the maturity buckets for USD instruments. The first two belong to one maturity band and the last one belongs to another maturity band. As explained earlier, the PFE computation starts with, at the derivative contract level. So first, the risk position will be calculated at the contract level independently. Now you can see nine risk positions, one at each contract level. To compute the risk position, we need to first compute or assign the following. Supervisory data, adjusted notional, and maturity factor. Once the risk positions are computed, then the roll-up starts to compute the PFE add-ons at hedging set level. The add-on is computed first at the hedging set level, but in case of the interest rate asset class, it is computed first at the bucket level, then the hedging set level. You can see this clearly in this flowchart. Again, to compute the add-on, we need to either compute or assign the following, supervisory correlation factor, effective notional, and supervisory factor. Once the add-on is computed at the hedging set level, then the aggregate add-on is computed at asset class level. You can see five different aggregate add-ons, one for each asset class. Later, 
all the aggregate add-ons are summed up to arrive at the aggregate add-on at netting set level. Then the multiplication factor is computed to address the over collateralization, which is not considered to now for computing the PF. Now by applying the formula of multiplier x aggregate add-on at netting set level, we can compute the PFE at the netting set level. In the early slide we have seen the replacement cost and now we have the PFE. So we can compute the exposure amount for each netting set by applying the formula of the exposure value 1.4 times RC plus PFE. Hope this helps you to visualize the step-by-step -step process of exposure amount computation using the SSCR. The SSCR guidelines are having both direct and indirect impact on bank business. These guidelines are required to be incorporated while implementing large exposure guidelines, leverage ratio, supplementary leverage ratio, and assessing the SVA risk. Indirectly, it influences the business of centrally clear derivatives, margining, and price of derivatives. The SSCR generally favors the margin transactions and clear transactions. The unmargined and non-netable transactions will result in more exposure amount, which will translate into more capital requirements for the bank. The implementation challenges are quite huge. As understood from the computations, the data requirements are quite huge. We need the information at different granularities. Need a lot of information around margin, unmargin transaction, initial margins, variation margins, and many more attributes to be captured at the transaction level. The computations are hugely complex. Need to do the computations at different levels of granularity like transaction level, hedging set level, asset class level, and at also netting agreement level. Multiple factors like supervisory factors, supervisory deltas, supervisory correlation factors need to be computed. Effectively, computation happens at the margin agreement level. So accordingly, we need to create the netting agreement group or subnetting agreement group. If required, we need to create supernetting group also. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like, comment, and share. If you need any clarification, please reach us out through our email. Please subscribe to Basel Practitioners for more videos on Battle 4 and FRTV.